Okay, user research for UX designers. Let's talk about it. I know it's not exactly our job as UX designers to do user research. We work with researchers, not beat researchers. Thank you, Ash, with all the H, right, for asking about this topic in my Discord community. At some point in our career, we still have to do some solo research. I mean, I work at Google. I still do solo research myself because it's a small team, you know. I just did one a few weeks ago, and this was my super packed, intense research schedule. Whew. Glad that it's done. Therefore, in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to address all those concerns. I will share everything I learned academically, professionally as a UX designer, and I will do that in three parts. Number one, I'm going to go through the three very common user research methods that the typical way is the ones that I use quite often. And two, data synthesis. Lastly, the presentation. How do you showcase your finding? How do you align with different teams? How do you convince other teams to buy into what you have to say? So now settle in, grab your favorite drink, and let's Get into it, y'all. Good morning, everyone. My name is Justine. I'm a designer working in Silicon Valley. To start any user research, you need to have a goal in mind. It's basically a question that you want to get an answer on. Here are two examples. How efficiently do people customize their items when shopping online? This is actually one of the ones that I did while I was at Google. Another example question. How do people plan a seven day vacation trip? Once you have your research question, now we need to do the actual research. So let's go to chapter one, common research methods. There are three methods that I use the most and also see a lot of other researchers use these three methods, which will be surveys, interviews, and observations. Let's start with survey. It's a questionnaire, it's a form with a lot of questions. You can use many different tools or platforms to get your survey out the door and get people to answer it. It could be Quartrix, it could be usertesting.com, it could be dscout, it could be even just a Google form that will be sufficient. So this is an example of what a survey in Google form looks like. How long does it take you to plan a seven day vacation and in the end with surveys you tend to get numbers it's five days two days one day which will be quantitative data and because survey is so easy to send out it's easy to get a large sample size you'll get a lot of responses which is great but at the same time because it's so easy to respond people might not take the same amount of care into responding which could lead to lower quality of data that's the nature and the trade-off of using surveys as the research method but it's still valid you can also tag one or two qualitative questions in the end like a free text response so you can get both quantitative numbers and also qualitative data but mostly it's for quantitative okay for numbers next is interviews whenever you do interviews it's mostly referring to a structured interview meaning you have the same set of questions to ask every participant at the same time there's also a semi-structured interview the only difference is with semi-structured interview you will start off with some other topics hey how's it going something is more loose more personal more conversational and then leads to those predetermined questions with structure you just ask those exact questions nothing more nothing less you can do all the interviews online. You can use FaceTime, Google Meet, Zoom, Microsoft Team, WebEx, I think it's a thing, Blue Jeans, so long ago. Oh my. Or even just in person, get them into the same room, ask them questions. With interviews, of course, it takes longer time, so the sample size you get will be a lot smaller. But of course, higher quality. Just remember when you ask questions, ask open questions to eliminate biases. Okay? What do you think is the most difficult step in your vacation planning? process instead of do you think booking a flight is the most difficult step in your vacation planning process no 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 the last common method is observation which you can do in a similar fashion as interviews whether it's facetime whether it's google meet virtually or in person let them interact with your product your app your website in front of you so in this session you basically ask them a question about completing some task and they would perform the task it's as basic as that. For example, can you show me how you decide on which places to visit for your vacation? So in the end, you have footages, right? Because you record this in which you can find a lot of quantitative information, numbers, and also qualitative information, like the way that they respond to your questions. And of course, I try to strive for both, get both type of data because they will be useful. Your finding will be more holistic. Of course, those are just three. They are way more like ethnography, focus group, longitudinal study. I just have not done them. I have not seen people do them. So we can talk about those in another time. Okay, okay. Even though I just gave you three, if you execute them well, 
you still get a lot of good data, you're off to a great start. And the next thing you need to do is to synthesize the data, which leads to chapter two, data synthesis. After you have done the research, you should likely get a sense of what direction you could be heading, or at least what kind of user pattern that you have identified. And if you don't, that's, that's fine too, because you still have to compile it anyways. Like I mentioned, there are two types of data, qualitative and quantitative. Let's go over them one by one. For qualitative data, especially you have the video recording, you can use many tools to transcribe them. Here are a few, Restream.io, Wizard.ai, CapCut. If you want to be super creative, you can just open up a Google Doc, click the sound search, play the video, and let Google Doc transcribe it for you. Ah, design thinking. If you took notes of some kind of highlight in the interview, you can just command F to find it in the transcription. So fast, so easy. Ultimately, you will have five quotes that could summarize the finding that highlight the top pain points. For example, people might say, flights are always tricky because of price fluctuation. Or the step that took the longest is aligning flights and hotels. Last bit about qualitative data, if you see what they do and what they say are kind of different, especially when you observe them interacting with your app, pay attention more to about what they do. For example, if they say, finding the restaurant actually took the longest, but in your observation, you will find out when they book flights, that's what actually took the longest, then leaning to more on the flight part. Next, quantitative data, you can use Google Sheet, filters, rank, use formula. The output is always a set of numbers. Maybe you have five out of five people find flight hard to plan, or 13 out of 17 people find it tends to go over budget when they plan for a vacation. One thing to keep in mind about quant is there's a term called statistically significant. It ensures the pattern the finding you have is actually conclusive and generalized to many, many more people. And I actually talked to a data scientist at Google about this, and he recommends at least a sample size of 20 to reach statistically significant. Statistically, statistical significance. Why is it so hard to pronounce? There are other literatures that you might see a rule of five. Of course, it will be faster, more resource efficient. It will still give you some idea. When I dig into it, I learn a few things. For the rule of five, it works better in qualitative data, so interviews like that. And you should try to do multiple sets of five interviews in several iterations. So it's pretty straightforward. The more you have, the better, 20, excellent. And of course, talking to five people is better than talking to no one. So what I typically do is minimum, minimum, minimum five, try to aim for 20. I might do something like 10, but try to do 20. I added a few links in the description. So read up about it, learn more. Don't just listen to me. I'm just somebody talking about my experience on YouTube, you know? Anyways, with quotes, with time data, with other numbers, next you have to put them together, present. So let's go to chapter three, the presentation. And let's see how we can strategically present to get everybody aligned and eliminate conflicting views. First of all, present it with focus. It means focus on your audience. What do they care about? Present that to them which means if you present it back to your UX team, your buddies, your friends, you can present more information, the method, the sample size, the analysis, the nitty gritty details, the nuances, because they care about those things, they enjoy debating, discussing on those little things. When you present to engineers, you need a different presentation, a different slide deck probably, because you will emphasis on a lot of numbers, because numbers are objective, are rational, that's how they think. Present more visuals, use images, use videos, put a giant red arrow pointing at the pain point or things that don't make sense so that when they see it, it's so much more easier for them to intake. If you present to business people, another presentation, you might need to put more numbers and tie those numbers into revenues, into profits, into how much cost you can help cut. If you present to managers, to leaderships, to CEOs, you will need a different deck. You will likely put less details, no sample size, no breakdown, no analysis, Put more emphasis on the problem they discovered, the result of the recommendation, the things that the company can do to be successful. When there are conflicting views, here are a few things you can do. Point all the views back to your research finding. 
Because at the end of the day, it's about the users. It's not about what they think. The research itself is literally about reaching a more objective conclusion about user pattern and behavior. So if other teams' opinions are different, uh, conflicting, uh, opposite of your research findings, tell them again, hey, this is a research finding. This is more reliable. Another tactic is you align with other teams first. Maybe you have five teams that actually align with your research finding. So you speak with them first. So when everybody in the same meeting, you can have your other allies convince the other team why this is a better way to go. Makes sense, right? And of course, there will be scenarios that none of these work. And I think that's politics and they are not reasonable. And in this case, you are actually doing everything right, everything you could. And what you will do next is you can talk to your manager about it. Let your manager handle it because that's their job. So you can let them know what's going on, hand them the research finding, and then you move on your other design work. And no matter what that evolves into, remember you at the end of the day are a UX designer. So any decks that you created, any report, any documentation, the whole purpose of the research is to give you design guidance, to point you to a design direction. And this part is also actually straightforward. If this is type of the A, B testing comparison type of study and research, and if A performs better, then there you go, you go with A, or you at least go with this direction. My example, when I was working on a drone delivery shopping app, my hypothesis was if the customization tab target is bigger, then it will be easier and faster for people to customize and add the item into the shopping cart. That's my hypothesis versus the solution at the time. And of course, this is better, so we went with this direction. If it's a discovery type of research, then your finding conclusion will be a little bit more abstract. For example, like Airbnb, they did research, discovery research, they found out during COVID lockdown, even though people cannot travel internationally, they still want to travel locally. But they would do shorter distance travel, maybe like two hour drives away. That's the finding. So how to design for this? Maybe in the app, you add a distance filter. Maybe you have a radius on a map. Maybe when you drive two hours, stay in one location for maybe a few days, you, you can travel to another place for two more hours. So your travel journey kind of extends. So that's how you can brainstorm off of discovery research. And there you go. That's how I do my solo research. If you're almost falling asleep, here are the five most essential takeaways in user research. Number one, understand qualitative data and quantitative data. You need both in your user research. Number two, sample size. Minimum, 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 minimum five and try to aim for 20. Number three, try to have minimal bias. Ask more open-ended question, no leading questions. Number four, understand needs and wants. They're not the same thing, they could be, but when they're different, solve the needs first. Number five, if what they say is different from what they do, trust more on what they do. And if you follow up on that, you might get some new interesting findings. I know, I know it's a very, very quick walkthrough. I cannot possibly pack all the nuances in a 10 minute video. If you have questions, let me know in the comments. And as always, keep designing a better future. I will see you all in these videos over there. Tschüss.